Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington, and today I'm on the hunt for poisonous, toxic plant species. That's right, we're talking plants that can cause us harm. Because it's important to know how to identify these plants, it's important to know where they can be found if we're interested in foraging for edible and medicinal plants. And not only that, but many of these poisonous plants have very interesting histories that I want to talk about in this video. And they're being used currently in various industries. And I want to do it before it's too late, because where I live there's a lot of deciduous forest, and many of these poisonous plants are very ephemeral, meaning they will disappear within a few weeks. So I want to find them before it's too late. So if you have a few minutes, what do you say you join me on the search for poisonous and toxic plant species? Here we have one of the deadliest plants in the entire world. And this one is poison hemlock. Conia maculatum. Now even though this is a poisonous plant, it belongs to a family of plants I'm sure you're used to eating. And that family of plants is Apiaceae. So if you've ever eaten carrots or parsley or parsnips or dill or fennel or even celery, then you've eaten a member of the Apiaceae family. It's a very large family of flowering plants, over 3,700 species worldwide. And poison hemlock is a deadly poisonous plant within the Apiaceae family. So let's look at that Latin name for a second, because it tells us a lot about this plant. So conium, the genus name, comes from the Greek word conus, which means to whirl about. And perhaps it has something to do with the symptoms experienced upon ingestion of this plant. And symptoms include ataxia, which is loss of full control of body movements, but also trembling and convulsions. And the maculatum refers to the spotted nature of some of these stalks, at least when this plant is older, when it sends up its flowering stalk, you'll see that the bases of these stalks have these purple splotches, these reddish dots on them. And many people say that this is Socrates' blood. Well, why Socrates? Well, one of the most notable deaths attributed to poison hemlock was Socrates. In 399 BC, he was administered juice from poison hemlock, which led to his death within maybe five to six minutes. So we see that in ancient Greece, many condemned prisoners were given the juice of poison hemlock to kill them. Now, this is a biennial plant, meaning it has a two-year life cycle. The first year, it lays pretty low to the ground, that's what I'm looking at right now. Then the second year, it sends up the flowering stalk, and overall this plant can grow to be between three to seven feet tall. And the flowers are produced in white umbels. Now, what I'm looking at right now are the dark green leaves. They're very dark green. You'll see that they're compound leaves, so they're divided multiple times, and they're very fern-like and lacy in appearance. Now, why is this plant so toxic? Why is it so deadly? Well, that's a loaded question. I don't think we'll ever really know the answer to it. However, we do know the compounds that are associated with the toxicity and what these compounds can do to the human body. So the compounds are known as alkaloids. These are nitrogen-bearing compounds found ubiquitously in the plant kingdom that have physiological effects on biological life forms, including human beings like you and me. And these alkaloids do not have very pleasant effects on the human body. And so some of the alkaloids are known as coniine. You read a lot about coniine, but also N-methylconiine and conhydrine. There's several other compounds, but it seems like coniine is the most potent, and it's the deadliest alkaloid found in poison hemlock. And so coniine has a nicotine-like effect on the body, but in a much more intense way. So coniine acts directly on the central nervous system, and ingestion of coniine, ingestion of this plant can lead to trembling, it can lead to rapid respiration, nausea, convulsions, coma, and ultimately death. And death is usually attributed to respiratory paralysis and respiratory failure. So it's not a very pleasant way to experience the afterlife, in my opinion. Now, toxicity is associated with many variables, including the time of the year, including soil conditions, including moisture, what part of the plant is harvested. But every part of this plant is considered deadly toxic because every part contains all those alkaloids, including coniine. Now, the most interesting point about all this is that even though this is a deadly poisonous plant, it had been used medicinally in Europe and also here in the United States. So it seems like the poison's really in the dose. So here in the United States, prior to World War I, over 30,000 pounds of the seeds had been imported to the United States, and over 15,000 pounds of the dried leaves had been imported to the United States to be used in drug formulations. So even though this may have been used in very specific instances for very specific conditions and very specific doses, it doesn't mean that we should be using this as a medicinal plant. This is definitely considered a deadly poisonous plant that should not be consumed. Now, because this is an invasive plant, you typically find this in disturbed areas. I'm seeing it on this edge right here. You also find it just like a weedy plant in people's garden beds sometimes, but you really see it along the sides of roads. And this is a nitrophilic plant, so it really likes soils with a high nitrogen content. This plant was brought here to the United States in the 1800s by Europeans as a garden plant, but it escaped cultivation. 
Now, it can be found pretty much in every single state in the United States. It's found all throughout North America and Europe and other parts of the world. So if you live in an area where this grows, I strongly recommend that you get to know this plant and learn this plant in all of its outfits, in the springtime, in the summertime, and in the fall right now, which is what I'm looking at. Because if you're interested in foraging for any plant, especially members of the APACA family, it's very important to understand which plants are deadly toxic in the APACA family. And this is just one of them. Poison hemlock, Conia maculatum, definitely a good plant to know. So I'm really excited to find this plant because this is one of those beautiful wild flowering plants in the eastern half of North America, and it produces these beautiful fruits in the autumn. So this is white bane berry. If we think about what bane means, we could probably determine that these fruits are probably not so good for us. So this is considered a toxic plant. It's also known as doll's eyes because of the way that these fruits resemble China doll's eyes. So this is in the Ranunculaceae family. What the heck is Ranunculaceae? Well, it's the buttercup family. Maybe you're familiar with buttercups. You know, there's flowers that come up all year round pretty much in our lawns. Those are buttercups. If you've ever consumed golden seal or taken a medicine made with golden seal, Hydrasis canadensis, that's a buttercup. Black cohosh is in the buttercup family, and this plant is as well. So this is Actea pachypoda, that's a Latin name. And Actea comes from the Greek word for elder, because I guess the leaves might resemble elderberry tree leaves. Maybe the fruits resemble elderberries, I don't really know. But pachypoda is way more apparent. That means thick foot, because these stalks where these fruits are produced are very thick. What else is unique, whenever you look at these fruits, you'll see that there's a little black dot right at the tip of them. That's why they call it doll's eyes. That's not just like a random black dot there. That's the remnant of the stigma of the flower. So the stigma is the female portion of the flower that receives the pollen. And this is the remnant right there. It sticks out long after the flower has disappeared and turned into these fruits. That's what you're seeing whenever you look at these doll's eyes plants. Now this plant grows to be between one and two and a half feet tall. And it's a perennial plant. Whenever you look at these leaves, they're alternately arranged and they're compound leaves that are toothed. And in late spring through early summer, you'll see that there are white flowers that are produced in a flowering structure known as a raceme. And each flower is only about a quarter of an inch across. And the berries are about a third of an inch in length. Now what's so toxic about doll's eyes? Well, actually the toxicity of this plant is largely unknown. It seems like there's some unknown glycoside compound which is responsible for the toxicity. But if you do consume this plant, it can lead to intense stomach burning, it can lead to vomiting, and it can lead to convulsions, especially the fruit. So this is definitely considered a poisonous fruit producing species. We wouldn't want to consume these fruits. However, whenever we look at the Ranunculaceae family, we see that there's one toxic compound that's very ubiquitous in that plant family. And that compound is known as protoanemonin. Well, what the heck is a protoanemonin? Well, that's a compound that's produced whenever these leaves are crushed or whenever they're bruised. So whenever we bruise these leaves or crush them, there's actually another compound known as ranunculin, which gets enzymatically broken down into two compounds. Glucose, that innocuous sugar compound, glucose, that's not that bad, but protoanemonin as well. It's found all throughout the ranunculaceae family, including this plant right here. And that compound can lead to contact dermatitis, so you don't want to get it a lot on your skin. You probably wouldn't want to ingest it either. Now, just because this is a toxic plant doesn't mean it hadn't been used medicinally here in the eastern half of North America. We see that various native cultures had utilized this plant for menstrual support, also to treat snake bites. So perhaps it does have limited medicinal application, but it has toxic compounds as well, which could lead to, as I mentioned before, intense stomach burning, vomiting, and convulsions. So we might not want to consume this plant. However, it's a beautiful native plant. If you live anywhere in the eastern half of North America, I encourage you to get out and look for this plant in its remaining days because it won't be around too much longer. The only plants that you might confuse this for would be other members in the Actea genus. You might confuse it for red baneberry, but this time of year, nothing looks like it with these white fruits in these thick pink stalks. You might also confuse it for black cohosh, but in flower, these two plants are completely different and the fruits are completely different as well. So this is a beautiful native plant. We'll consider it a toxic plant known as white baneberry or doll's eyes, Actea pachypoda. Here we have a native understory shrub that contains many toxic properties. However, many cancer drug researchers are interested in this plant because it produces a very medically important compound. We'll talk about that in one second. So this is Taxus canadensis, the Canada U plant. Typically inhabits the northeastern half of the United States and northeastern half of North America. And it's typically found in later successional forests, meaning areas that aren't recently cut over. You're not really seeing it in areas with a lot of red maple trees, a lot of pioneer species. You see it in areas with beech trees, with sugar maple trees, and eastern hemlock trees. 
So this is an evergreen understory shrub. You find it in the understory and it's a trailing shrub. So it doesn't really grow to be more than a meter high. Whenever you think of the Eastern Hemlock tree, and it kind of resembles an Eastern Hemlock tree, the Eastern Hemlock tree grows to be tall. It grows to be about 140 to 150 feet high. Not so with this one. Now the leaves of this plant are flattened, but there's a needle-like tip at the point. And if you look at the underside, you'll see that there aren't two silver strips like you would find in the Eastern Hemlock tree. So the Eastern Hemlock tree has these two silver strips in the bottom of each leaf. That's the stomata, and that's how the plant essentially breathes. But you don't see it with this plant right here. Now you really don't find the Canada U plant in areas with high moose population and high deer population because those animals really like to browse on this foliage and prevent it from thriving. But birds also like this plant, but for a different reason. They really like those red arils, those berry-like structures. Maybe you're familiar with those arils. Whenever you think about cultivated U plants in many people's yards, you see those red berry-like structures. That red aril is the only edible portion of the plant. You do not want to consume that seed that's found within this plant. So this is a conifer, it's a cone-bearing species. Whenever we think of conifers, we think of the trees that produce cones, like pine cones and spruce cones. But where are the cones in this one? Well, I don't see any on this plant, but that arrow inside that red fleshy structure is the seed cone. And that arrow is essentially a modified scale. It's a single scale covering the cone inside. But it turns into the fleshy structure that can be consumed so long as you do not consume that inner seed. So you definitely want to spit that out because it contains many toxic compounds. Speaking of toxicity, what's so toxic about the Canada U plant? Well, there are classes of compounds known as taxines and taxanes. And many of these compounds have cardiotoxic properties. They can lead to convulsions, they can lead to severe drops in blood pressure, and ultimately they can lead to heart failure. Now, interestingly, those compounds also have cytotoxic properties, specifically the taxanes. They have cytotoxic properties meaning they can destroy living cells. And so this caught the attention of the USDA and also the National Cancer Institute in the 1950s and 1960s. They worked together and sent people around the world looking for species, plant species that had chemotherapeutic properties. And they analyzed over 30,000 different samples and found that the Pacific yew tree, which is Taxus brevifolia, in the bark it contained a compound known as paclitaxel. And that's a taxane compound so it has toxic properties, but when used very specifically against cancer cells, it can basically stop cell replication in cancerous cells. And so Paclitaxel now has a trade name, which is Taxol, which is one of the most popular and utilized anti-cancer drugs, chemotherapeutic drugs in the market. It's being used for ovarian cancer, it's being used for breast cancer and lung cancer. Now, even though it has been used successfully, it also has some serious side effects as well but it is on the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicines, that paclitaxel compound. Now interestingly, because it was isolated from the bark of the Pacific yew tree, that tree is prone to overharvesting because if you strip a lot of the bark from the living trees, well the tree is not going to live anymore. So a lot of researchers started looking for alternatives to that tree and they analyzed other taxa species and they found that this one, Taxus canadensis, has that paclitaxel compound even found in the foliage. So if you strip the foliage, and the researchers use the foliage, well the plant can still continue to carry out most of its physiological properties. And in Quebec right now, many specimens are being harvested by the cancer industry for that compound paclitaxel. Now just because this plant has toxic properties, it doesn't mean that this plant hadn't been used for medicinal purposes in the eastern half of North America. We see that multiple cultures prior to European colonization utilized Taxus canadensis. They used the twigs and they used the leaves as well for medicinal purposes. However, unless you know what you're doing, I would definitely not consume any other portion of this plant save for that red arrow whenever you can find it. Just make sure you definitely spit out that seed. So this is a beautiful native understory shrub. If you live in the northeastern half of North America, get out and see if you can find this plant. Again, you typically find it in later successional forests. Look for the beech trees, look for the sugar maples, look for the eastern hemlock trees, and look for this beautiful plant, which we call Taxus canadensis, or the Canada U. So there we have it, three poisonous species. We talked about Conium maculatum, the poison hemlock plant, the one that killed Socrates in 399 BC. We talked about Actea pachypoda, doll's eyes, the plant who has poisonous fruits, Yet the plant had been used medicinally for menstrual support and to treat snake bites. And of course, we talked about Taxus canadensis, the Canada U, the toxic plant that has red edible arils. And the plant also produces a medically important compound known as paclitaxel, which is on the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicines. Thank you so much for watching this video. Truly appreciate it. I encourage you to get out there, look for plants of all shapes, sizes, colors, and of course, uses. Thanks again. See you in the next video.